Hi, I'm Don Deal. I'm the Director of Research and Development for Norm Geisler International Ministries. Welcome to the second International Christian Apologetics Marathon here at the Trinity Channel, the fifth day. You know, the Trinity Channel is part of ABNSAT and has a suite of channels for different languages, and we encourage you to explore the website and to take a chance to peruse and see what exactly what we offer. Today's show's on science and faith, and what we're going to discuss today is the scientific accuracy of the Bible. What does modern science have to say about the Bible? Is the Bible a book of science? Does the theory of evolution prove that the Bible's wrong? Do discoveries in physics damage the claim that God created the universe? These are among the kind of questions we're going to try to answer today on the scientific accuracy of the Bible. Joining me today are Dr. Gene Leitner. Dr. Leitner studied animal science and veterinary medicine at The Ohio State University. She received a BS in agriculture, a doctorate in veterinary medicine, and an MS in veterinary preventative medicine. Today, she is active in research and writing in areas of biology and genetics. She has found that the biblical history provides a more robust framework for understanding the biological world than the evolutionary one she was taught in school. Based on the biblical history and what is known from genetics, there are some clear predictions that can be made which are increasingly being confirmed by the scientific literature. In addition to her research, Dr. Leitner is, the adjunct, is an adjunct instructor with Liberty University Online, teaching biology and creation studies. She also serves as a board member of the Creation Research Society, an organization that averages over 600 voting members who have advanced science degrees and hold to a young earth view of creation. Welcome to the show, Dr. Leitner. Our next guest is Dr. Fazali Rana. Biochemist Fazali Fuzz Rana writes and speaks extensively about evidence for creation emerging from biochemistry, genetics, human origins, and synthetic biology. As Vice President of Research and Apologetics at Reasons to Believe, that's RTB, as in the website rtb.org, he is dedicated to communicating to skeptics and believers alike the power, powerful scientific case for God's existence and the Bible's reliability. Formerly a senior scientist in research and development at Procter & Gamble, Fuzz graduated with highest honors from West Virginia State College, which is now university, with a BS in chemistry and went on to earn a PhD in chemistry with an emphasis on biochemistry from Ohio University, where he was twice awarded the Donald Clippinger Research Award. He pursued postdoctoral studies in the biophysics of cell membranes at the University of Virginia and Georgia. Welcome to the show, Dr. Rana. Thank you for having me. And our third guest tonight on our pe expert panel for the first session is Prim Isaac. Prim is a member of Southern Evangelical Seminary's Truth Evangelism Apologetics Mission, that is TEAM. He holds an undergraduate degree with a double major in physics and computer science and an MA in philosophy from Southern Evangelical Seminary. Despite a Christian upbringing, Prim became an evolutionist and an agnostic in his preteen years when his interest in science led him to ask questions that his church could not answer. After obtaining answers to his questions, Prim came back to the Lord in 1989 and since then has taught New Testament and apologetics at churches and colleges, both nationally and internationally. Prim currently resides in Charlotte with his wife, Annie, and his two children, and he's a friend of mine. Welcome, Prim. Thank you for having me. It's so good to have all of you. So today, and, and also, just to let everyone else know, don't run away at any point because we have a special, uh, additional special guest that will be coming on in about an hour when we move from more biological topics into more of a, uh, the physics direction. All right, the scientific accuracy of the Bible. Let's start it off with a question. Let's start with Dr. Leitner. Does the Bible make scientific claims? Interesting. It certainly makes truth claims about the world around us, and it makes truth claims about history, what happened in history. So there are claims it makes that relate to science. And in fact, there are things it describes in our world that we know from science are true. Uh, for example, the water cycle is discussed in scripture, not in incredible detail, but in enough that you can tell it's talking about the water cycle. And we can explore and learn more today, but what it says is accurate. Excellent. Dr. Rana, would you like to get on to this? Does the Bible make scientific claims? Uh, yeah, I would very much agree with Dr. Leitner's answer that uh, the Bible is not primarily a, a book about science, of course. It's a book about how uh, human beings relate to our creator 
and how that creator has brought about a plan of redemption through the person of Jesus Christ. That's the emphasis of scripture. But many places, uh, scripture teaches us that um, the reason why we can trust the claims of God when he uh, unveils for us his plan of redemption is because he is the creator. And there are specific descriptions of God's work as creator, not only in the creation accounts, but littered throughout scripture, sprinkled throughout scripture. And so these claims about God's work as creator have implications that are scientifically testable. And I think when you apply, uh, you know, those kind of scientific uh, critiques to scripture, what you find is that scripture passes with flying colors in every instance. Okay, Prem, Prem, do you have an opinion on this subject? Oh, I agree with both Dr. Leitner and Dr. Rana that the scripture makes claims about the physical world around us, and uh, science has really been catching up with what scripture has said about a variety of subjects. Uh, for example, the idea that uh, human beings sh uh, share uh, a common substance with the dust of the earth. Scripture teaches that human beings are created from the dust of the earth. And what we find is that there is a chemical unity between the structure of human beings and, and the earth itself. So, uh, the, and what that we refer to as um, atoms and molecules and so on. So the same stuff that the earth is made of is what human beings are also ultimately made of at a chemical level. So that's just one example out of many uh, so it's important to remember that wherever the, the, the scripture teaches about the physical world, it is making scientific claims which are accurate. Uh, Dr. Rana, would you agree with him that the chemistry and the physics, uh, the microscopic physics of how nature work in the natural world and in the human body are, are unified in some sense? Oh, yeah. I think that's a, an excellent point that Prem makes. And, and in fact, if I may, I would actually just extend it a little bit further, uh, because it, you're making reference, uh, Prem, to Genesis 2-7 that talks about Adam being created from the dust of the earth. Mm. You know, and so, you know, Carl Sagan once one time quipped that we are all stardust. Well, the fact of the matter is we are made out of the same substance as the stars and as the planet Earth. Again, you know, as you mentioned, molecules atoms and molecules. But what's also interesting is Genesis 2.19 speaks about the birds and the animals being made from the dust as well. And so that indicates that we're made out of the same material as the other animals are. And so if one could reason from that that we would be made from the same building blocks as other, that, that humans and other creatures would be made from the same building blocks, which implies that we should be, again, similar at a biochemical level. You could even argue similar at a genetic level, uh, similar at a uh, physiological and an anatomical level. And so therefore, when people claim, well, humans and the great apes, for example, share this high degree of genetic similarity, and that's evidence for common descent, you could actually look at that as actually being evidence for the fact that we're made from the same blueprint and the same raw materials as other creatures, as scripture indicates. So this idea of a 99% genetic similarity between humans and chimps, which is so often touted as evidence for evolution, is actually something that scripture, in effect, predicts and, again, goes to its scientific accuracy. It sounds like you're saying that there's a mind uh, behind the plan. If you say plan, obviously plans are made by minds. Dr. Leitner, would you agree with that, and what would you add to this? Yes. When you start to study biology in detail, you find that there's astounding design everywhere. And the deeper you look, the more design there is. Amazing. Mm, we seem to be having some kind of uh, technical problem with Dr. Leitner's sound. Uh, hope, hopefully uh, we can get that corrected. I'm sorry about that, Dr. Leitner. We'll try to get that fixed. Uh, let's go back to Prim. We talked about their scientific claims within the Bible. That is, it says that historically certain things occurred in certain order and such. Would you say those claims in the Bible are testable? Well, definitely some of them are testable. Uh, many of them are some things that we can observe. So common experience will agree with some of the claims being made in the Bible. As an example, in Genesis chapter 1, we find that the Bible teaches that every kind of animal or plant produces offspring after its own kind. And so, in other words, there is there's a what we refer to as a genetic unity between uh, 
every generation of plants and animals within each within its own kind. Now, by kind, we probably should take it to be something a little bit more broad than species. But what we do find is that once we understood genetics, which happened only about 150 years ago, we actually understand the basis for offspring being the, of the same kind as the, the previous generation. So, okay. uh, so scripture basically uh, makes this claim, and that is exactly what we observe. Okay, we think we have the technical difficulties with Dr. Leitner straightened up, so let's bring her in on this. Uh, Dr. Leitner, uh, Prim mentioned the, the word kind. When you look in the taxonomy in the biological textbooks, you don't see the word kind. Would you like to elaborate on, on how the Bible's uh, version of kind relates to biology in some sense? Yes, it's interesting because in the book of Genesis, we read that God created creatures according to their kind and told them to reproduce and fill the earth. And if that's true, then the foxes we find in the desert and the foxes we find in the Arctic and the foxes we find throughout the world are probably all related because they spread out and they fill the earth. So you find typically even animals that are classified as different species can often interbreed if they're similar. Finches, for example, they often can interbreed. They don't usually, but they can. And so we would recognize that all the ones that can interbreed together would belong to the same kind. And that has been helpful to me in my research. I have used that part of the biblical history. I've used the fact that the kinds were preserved on the the ark during the flood. And that means that the population was very small at that time. In fact, in some kinds, there were only two mm. that were preserved, but the populations were very small. And then I look at the genetic variation that I see today, even just in dogs, and in particular genes, there's a lot of variety today. Well, that didn't happen by accident. The evolutionists say, oh, all changes to DNA are just accidents. They're just random chance events. But that's not true. And in fact, if we look into the scientific literature, the cells have enzymes specifically to cut DNA. They can make changes to DNA, and they can stitch DNA back together. And that's done in various places. It's done in the immune system, um, uh, the part of your body that protects against um, invading um, bacteria and the like. And it's done also in the cell divisions for the next generation. So we find that what the evolutionists had taught me all through school was not true. But if I take the biblical history, I would have known that. And so that's really exciting to see that the, what we see in science fits with the biblical history. So you're saying that you found you're science to you confirm your faith, <laughs> not to challenge it uh, directly. Yeah, in fact, the science challenged the evolutionary beliefs that I had held because I had assumed the evolutionists were right on that. And I didn't realize it was a philosophy. It was not something that had been scientifically confirmed. But the science doesn't match the evolutionary philosophy. It's consistent with the biblical history. Dr. Rana, you wrote the book, cells Des The Cells Design. Would you like to get involved in this discussion a little bit? Yeah, well, you know, um, one of the things that to me is extremely uh, striking when you look at biological systems and specifically biochemical systems, which is my area of expertise, is that the appearance of design is absolutely overwhelming. Uh, you know, biological systems are so elegant and sophisticated in the way that they're designed. There's a whole area now of um, engineering called biomimetics, where engineers are actually looking to uh, designs in nature as inspiration to solve engineering problems. And so from my perspective, if you think of biology as evolutionary biologists do, as essentially the outworking of unguided, uh, undirected, historically contingent processes that are just co-opting pre-existing structures, including them together to produce designs that are just good enough for survival, why on earth would you, you, you turn to those kinds of systems and use them as inspiration for design. And so the fact that we even have disciplines like biomimetics, to me, indicate uh, that uh, biological systems really are designed by the work of a mind, by a, a creator. And when we move to biochemistry, the evidence for design is even more mind-boggling than what we see when we look at, again, macroscopic systems. And so 
you know, to me, design is, is very much a part of, of biology and biochemistry. And that design, I think, very powerfully points to a creator like what we see in the God of the Bible. Uh, excellent. So you're saying there's definitely a mind behind the system. Uh, was, the next question I was going to ask was, does the Bible help us understand the world around us? I think, Dr. Leitner, I think you've already kind of answered that. Would you like to expand a little bit? Um, okay. Um, it's been helpful in that way to understand um, the world around us and, and understand that, hey, we should be finding certain aspects of design um, in certain places. Um, the other thing that's really interesting about the Bible is it has a few details that I find um, were really impressive. The dimensions on the ark, for example. The skeptics had claimed that the, the flood account was copied from the Babylonians, but the Babylonians have a cube. And if you test scientifically a cube and the dimensions of the ark and a number of other dimensions, this was done in a wave pool. They found that the ark was very stable. The design was more barge-like, and it was a very stable design. And then if you go ahead and do calculations, and I used the information on kinds, and I was a part of a big project where we did calculations. Okay, how many kinds of animals would need to be on the ark? Was there enough space? And we did all those calculations, and despite what the skeptics say, we found there was plenty of room for all the different kinds of animals on the ark. So the, the, the boat that God instructed Noah to build works. The biblical one works. There's no other flood legend in any other culture that has dimensions that would do the job it needed to do. So you're saying such as the Epic of Gilgamesh, that that one's clearly falsifiable and is falsified. Yeah, I, I, I don't think we have any problem with that. Well... Uh, what scientific claims are in the Bible? I mean, we talked a little bit about that. We've been focusing on the biological side. Prem, I know you're, you have a more of a physics background. Does the Bible say anything about the universe? Oh, absolutely, without, without a question. What we find is that the Bible affirms that space, time, and matter began at a finite point in, in the past. So if we look at the history of uh, modern science uh, in, the, in the Western world, we find that all the way until the time of uh, Albert Einstein, the prevailing view of the universe was that the universe was that space and time were sort of always present and that the universe was somehow eternal and that at some point God created objects within the universe and populated the universe with the galaxies and stars and planets and so on. But as our physics actually improved, uh, especially with uh, the theory of general relativity as proposed by Albert Einstein and the solutions to the field equations of general relativity, what we find is that science shows us that the universe had a beginning. And by universe, we don't just mean that the objects in the universe had a, had a beginning, but space and time itself didn't always exist. But this is exactly what we find the Bible to be claiming in the very first verse of the very first chapter of the very first book of the Bible, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the beginning there is the beginning of time. The heavens represent all of space at that point, and the earth represents all the matter that there was uh, being referred to in that text. So, so where would you relate that to in the Bible? Well, I would say that uh, Genesis 1.1 teaches the... Uh, ex nihilo creation of a space-time matter continuum. Mm. So, so uh, that's, would, that's would you... one, at least one claim. Uh, the, the other claim I'd like to mention is that uh, living organisms cannot simply be, be uh, created just from matter alone. They need information. So the scripture seems to suggest that God had to create living things for the very first time using uh, intelligence, using design and wisdom, uh, abstract ideas that are not in themselves physical. And uh, what we find in biology is that once you have something living, it reproduces after its own kind. But what evolution has not been able to answer is the question of first life. That is to say, 
how did the very first living thing come about from that which is not living? And we find that um, evolutionists like uh, Yuri and Miller, Miller have tried to reproduce what they thought to be the primordial conditions under which life first formed. And no matter how hard they tried, they could not produce anything that uh, closely resembled a living organism. And that, if the Bible is true, that's exactly what you'd expect. Uh, the Bible actually does make this claim that the very first living organism of each major kind of plant and animal had to be created uh, by an intelligent creator. Hmm. So, Dr. Rama, you, I'm sorry, supply. go ahead. I'm sorry, please. Sorry. I'm sorry. Are you finished? I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say that information uh, for a living organism to come into being for the very first time, information has to be supplied from the outside of the physical world. Okay, I have two questions for Dr. Rana. Do you agree with what Prem just said, and can that information be quantified, and if so, how? Uh, well, you know, I do very much agree with what Prem said. Uh, the origin of life problem is, in, in my opinion, intractable. And if you press uh, anybody who actually is active in origin of life research, regardless of their worldview perspective, they will agree that we do not have currently an explanation for the origin of life. And in fact, every attempt to really account for the origin of life has led to dead ends and has led to failure. And so I very much agree that the origin of life is an unsolved problem. And in effect, it looks as if the origin of life is miraculous. And I think uh, Prem is making a very good point too, that in, in essence, life uh, at its core, in, in terms of its core systems, its most fundamental systems, are information systems. And one of the things that I find rather mind-boggling as a biochemist is that the way in which those information systems are structured and the way that they are manipulated by the cell's machinery is identical to how we would structure and manipulate information ourselves. So for example, in the last decade, a scientists have come to appreciate that the cell's machinery that manipulates DNA are literally functioning like computer systems at their basic, most fundamental level. In other words, the, the enzymes that are manipulating DNA are functioning like Turing machines. And, and Turing machines are, the again, the theoretical foundation for how computer systems function. Uh, and in fact, the, the similarity between, again, these biochemical computers and man-made computers is so stark that there's a whole area of nanotechnology that's been birthed called DNA computing, where scientists are literally building computers out of DNA and the enzymes in the cell that manipulate the DNA. Uh, Leonard Adelman at the University of Southern California is one of the, the pioneers in this area. And there's tremendous advances that are happening. It may be that in the next decade or so, we actually are going to be utilizing for technology purposes DNA-type uh, computer systems, which again is mind-boggling. Uh, but these DNA computers are actually more powerful than the most powerful supercomputer system we have available to us today. And so this, to me, again, is extremely provocative. And I find explanation in this recognizing that we as human beings are made in God's image. If we are made in God's image, then we are going to be many creators, uh, just as the creator who made us is, again, uh, one of his characteristics is that he is a creator. We too are going to be creators because we bear God's image. And isn't it interesting that the technology that we produce is, again, in resonance with the technology that we see in the, in the cell, yet the cell's technology is far superior and far more advanced than anything that we could even imagine. Uh, so to me, I see, again, what, what Prem is saying is very much the case, that that information, in my, in, from my perspective, comes from a mind. That's the only source that we know that accounts for the origin of information. So if we see that biochemical systems are, in their essence, information, that suggests that they must come from the work of a mind. But the, the similarity between human designs and the designs in biological systems, to me, supports this notion that we're made in God's image, uh, again, which is what Scripture teaches. So, so when uh, uh, someone like Bill Gates says that DNA is like a computer program, but orders of magnitude more complex than any computer program, Dr. Leitner, I see you're shaking your head in agreement. Would you like to get on board on this a little bit? Well, I definitely agree. That was uh, well explained. 
Um, just to extend it a little bit, um, I had mentioned the enzymes in a cell for DNA editing, and now we are copying that. And we are using the basic types of things cells were already doing to do our own DNA editing. So we put in what we want. So we have copied an awful lot from what is there. And it's amazing. So the one thing it does tell me is while we're intelligent and created in God's image, he's far, far, far wiser than we are. It's, it's amazing. Uh, I don't think anybody on our panel would disagree with that one, Dr. Leitner. Uh, Prim, does the Bible help us understand the world around us? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Sure. Does the Bible help us understand the world around us? Does it help you make sense of the world as opposed to the uh, random chance plus necessary law type hypothesis? Yes. Uh, so, obviously, the, the Bible s seems to suggest uh, and, in fact, claim that information precedes everything that... Uh, we read in the Gospel of John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and that all things were made by Him, and there was nothing that was made that was not made by Him. So obviously referring to pre-incarnate Christ and the information that He supplies by speaking the world into existence. So this means that information is prior to everything in the universe. So the more we study uh, the physical universe, whether that's at the biological level or at the level of the universe itself, which would be cosmology, what we find is the existence of laws, but not only laws, there are certain contingent features of the universe. So by contingent, what I mean is that it's possible to conceive of a different variety of possible universes uh, which could have been configured differently, just like when you buy a computer system, you can configure the computer system in a variety of ways. But only certain configurations, a very a small fraction of these configurations can permit the universe, can, can allow the universe to permit life and to sustain life. So that means that while the universe could have been created from a standpoint of randomness, in so many different ways, for some reason it has been created with the exact set of parameters to permit life. And so, once again, what I think what we find is that the idea that there has to be some intelligence that exists prior to the universe and prior to just there simply being matter in motion, um, that, that there had to be a, a, a design and a tuning of the universe. Uh, that being said, I'd like to say one more thing, and that is this notion of randomness. Uh, when we say something is random, I take it to mean that we are unable to tell what the causes are. So, for example, if you're outside your house during a tornado, uh, you could probably uh, feel like the wind is blowing against you in, in an unpredictable way. And hence, you could, you could say, well, the wind is just sort of blowing randomly. Uh, what we really mean is that it's unpredictable. Uh, what we do not mean is that the direction of the wind is without any prior cause. So we know from understanding Newtonian mechanics that the speed and direction of, of uh, physical particles uh, are due to forces being applied on them. And uh, if we didn't understand this really well, we wouldn't be able to build and fly planes or send the space shuttle up into, into space and bring it back safely. Uh, so the idea of randomness is somewhat misleading. I, I, I think that there's nothing that's actually random in the physical world. It's only random in the sense that we are unable to track these things uh, using uh, our methods. And so we use statistical methods and we build a model in which we say something behaves randomly. Um, but in fact, uh, there's no physical basis for randomness itself. We need to take a break now. Uh, you're, if you're just joining us, you're here on the Trinity Channel where on the Science and Faith Show we're discussing the scientific accuracy of the Bible. You know, the Trinity Channel is available via apps for the iPhone, iPad. It's available on IPTV. It's available via the web. It's, 
it's being broadcast on satellite and it's also via TCT on a certain number of broadcast channels. But all these, all these areas, all these things cost money. The process, the uh, studios, the equipment, the bandwidth, the everything costs money. So please consider giving to Trinity Channel. You can find it on the website at ABNSAT or at the trinitychannel.com. You can find a way to give there. Hello everyone. If you're watching the news and you look around at the things that are going on in the world, you may notice that we are in perilous times, and we are. But there's a positive side that we should not miss. This is also a time of opportunity. Uh, people are killing and raping and beheading because they have believed a lie. And you combat the lie with the truth. And Christians have an opportunity right now that we have not had for 14 centuries of Islam. For 14 centuries, if you wanted to share the gospel with Muslims and refute Islam, you had a very good chance of dying. But right now, in our time, we have an opportunity to share the gospel with Muslims because many Muslims are coming to the West for school or, or through immigration. And now we can share the gospel with them in complete safety. But at the same time, we can reach Muslims even in Muslim countries. We can reach Muslims around the world from this studio. But we can only do that with your help. I encourage you to support the Trinity Channel so that as we share the truth, it will go out to people around the world and will convince Muslims that Jesus Christ is Lord through the power of the gospel. Hi, I'm Don Deal, and this is the Trinity Channel. And if you missed the first 30 minutes, for goodness sakes, please consider watching the replay on YouTube later because you're missing an excellent discussion on the scientific accuracy of the Bible with Dr. Gene Leitner. Dr. Fazali Rana, and also Prim Isaac. Thank you all for joining us tonight. And uh, for the panel, let's, uh, let's move from general Bible topics. Let's move to a little bit more towards uh, specific fields. Let's go towards biology. Uh, I'll throw this out here for Dr. Leitner first. How can we trust the Bible when scientists say that life came about through evolution? Well, evolution is interesting. And the Evolution can be used to mean change over time, or evolution may be used to mean that human beings descended uh, from an ape-like ancestor, which descended from simpler life forms. And so the fact that things change somewhat over time is obvious. We can measure that and observe that even in our world today. But the idea that that necessarily means that we all have a common ancestor, it doesn't logically fit. For example, I talked about changes in DNA and the fact that the cell can control some of them. Well, even changes to DNA that are adaptive, even changes to DNA that are helpful in a particular environment for an organism, they don't build complexity. In fact, they erode complexity. So the changes an organism needs in order to adapt to a new environment require the complexity to be there first and then it can make the changes to adapt to that environment. The changes are going in the wrong direction. If evolution were true, mutations should build complexity. It had to come from somewhere. And um, evolutionists say it wasn't created, so they think they can get it to just show up by random mutation and natural selection, and it doesn't work. Things are going in the wrong direction. They require that complexity to begin with, even to be able to adapt. So the direction is all wrong for evolution. So Dr. Rana, uh, I've seen where uh, the unguided evolution proponents would say something like, whenever a sequence in the DNA is duplicated and, the, and when it's passed on, that you've doubled the information. What, what would you say to someone like that? Well, you know, to me, um, you know, the whole idea of can evolutionary mechanisms generate information or not is is kind of a tricky conversation because it really depends on exactly what you mean when you talk about information and how exactly are you defining information and that type of thing uh, but you know from my perspective you know I would very much agree with what Gene Leitner says Dr. Leitner says in that um, in my experience it's very difficult to envision how you could have uh, evolutionary changes to, or sorry, genetic changes to the DNA 
mutational changes to the DNA that have any kind of real opportunity to have creative power or potential. Most of the changes to DNA are degenerative, they're deleterious, they, they wind up degrading systems, not actually enhancing or expanding upon those systems. And so uh, it, may be, it may be conceivable that if you do have a gene duplication that, take pl that takes place and you are doubling the information, but it's very difficult to go from that mechanism to envisioning how you're going to actually create or generate some kind of novel biological system uh, that, uh, again, is a complex system that is able to be functional in a particular environment. And so, you know, I just don't see uh, evolutionary mechanisms having creative power or potential. Prem, do you have an opinion on this subject? Yeah, I, I think that everything that we know about how information is processed shows that it, we are not able to generate information from any unguided process. Uh, even if we see variations happening to an organism, we must remember that we all, we're, we're working with existing DNA. And you can modify something that's existing and get a variety, but you can't really generate new functionality uh, and be able to translate that into a new kind of organism with new capabilities. For example, an organism that, that is unable to fly, uh, uh, just the idea that random mutations can accumulate over time to be able to give that organism the ability to fly. I mean, flying is such a complex and precise, it requires pr precise engineering to produce something that is able to to fly. And so you're saying that's not, just, not just a simple change, but you have to have muscular, you have to have bone, you have to have uh, balance systems, all those concurrently evolving simultaneously? Right. There's, the complexity has to, has to be present from the, from the get-go to be able to produce something um, that, is, that has the functionality of being able to fly or being able to use sonar, which bats do, and, and so do dolphins and whales. I mean, there are these incredibly intricate systems uh, that are not reducible. So there are plenty of uh, irreducibly complex aspects to living creatures. And it's really difficult to plot out uh, in reverse. If we were to play the video, a video of all living things uh, in reverse, you, could, you should be able to see creatures devolving, as it were, evolution happening in reverse and you should be able to get to a simpler and simpler flying animal that is still able to fly, but is, is simpler than anything we know. And at a certain point, you hit a brick wall, which is that you can't go any simpler and still have the animal be able to fly. So uh, I would say that like that, at the macro level, I'm using flying as an example, but even at the microscopic level, at the biochemical level, there are many mechanisms within cells, as an example, uh, that require multiple components, which all have to be present at the same time and cannot be made any simpler. Well, if they can't be made any simpler, that means that those mechanisms could not have been created from simpler uh, versions of themselves. And so this means there's no pathway of evolution, even a possible pathway, for these uh, mechanisms to be produced. I, th I think the... Uh... The standard evolutionist answer to that sort of response would be that they were simply cobbled together or, or the aspects of the, uh, such as the flagellar motor, were borrowed from other parts of the cell and then they just happened to work together to provide a, uh, uh, something that worked for the cell. Dr. Leitner, would you, would you like to get in on this? <laughs> yeah, a lot of those um explanations sound like they're invoking magic. It's like, oh yeah, they just happen to do this and they just happen to do that. It's like, well, that's great in a story, but how do you get it to work in the real world? <laughs> we don't observe things like that. So you're saying that proof of concept doesn't equal proof of uh, acti actual activity. <laughs> True, and a lot of times you'll find, even when they say, well, it was co-opted from something simpler, um, there's an awful lot of components that have to show up simultaneously. It's not a step-by-step -step process. And in fact, from what I've heard, is they think it's probably the reverse, that 
you eventually that there are examples where the flagella degenerated and you got a different structure that had a slightly different function. Uh, Dr. Rana, I, know, I, I believe you have a slightly different view on this uh, irreducible complexity story. Would you, would you like to get involved in this and uh, maybe we can uh, get a little bit different viewpoint on this? Well, I wouldn't say that I would necessarily be in, in stark disagreement with either Dr. Leitner or with, with Prem on this particular issue. Uh, you know, I, I do think that uh, evolutionary biologists, as you mentioned, Don, will appeal to co-option as a way to explain how uh, irreducibly complex systems could come into being. And so, you know, that, um, again, is, a, is a, a conceptual model for how you could conceivably generate irreducibly complex systems. But as Dr. Leitner points out, uh, there is a lot of hand-waving going on, and I've yet to see anybody present uh, a real compelling, uh, plausible scenario for, again, how uh, you would generate, um, you know, irreducibly complex systems through the mechanism of co-option, except for a couple of instances where I have seen something that looks, again, um, like it's not complete, a completely outlandish story, if you will. Uh, but I think it's just important for people to be aware of what the evolutionary biologist's response would be to this particular issue. Um, you know, that, again, co-option may be a way to round this idea of irreducible complexity. Uh, you know, one of the points that I make in the cell's design is that uh, oftentimes uh, Christians and Christian apologists equate the idea of irreducible complexity with the argument for design. I know I'm not saying that Pram or Gene are doing that, but I, I, I can counter that a lot. And I think it's important for people to realize that the case for design, <coughs> excuse me, is far more robust than just irreducible complexity. And so from my perspective, even if you granted an evolutionary biologist the co-option argument, there's still such a very powerful case that could be made for design and so many intractable problems with the origin of life and with the evolutionary paradigm in general that we still have a very strong basis for skepticism about the claim that evolution can generate life and can explain life's history. Is that, is that uh, God of the gaps argument? Um, no, I wouldn't say it's a God of the gaps argument because um, uh, it's possible to make a very robust case for design based on uh, the features uh, that we understand about the cell's chemistry. So, for example, I would even say irreducible complexity could be used to make a positive argument for design uh, where you would just simply say human beings make designs that oftentimes are irreducibly complex. And so, therefore, if we encounter irreducibly complex systems inside the cell, it's rational to think that these are the product of a mind. That's not a God of the gaps argument, but right. rather it's a positive argument that you could then couple with, again, outstanding problems for the origin of life. So I don't see that as, as a God of the gaps argument whatsoever. So you're saying that it's an argument from analogy or, or of a parallel and not an argument from we don't know, therefore God did it. Exactly. And if I, you know, real quickly could bring up another point, uh, there's a whole new area that's very hot now in biology called synthetic biology, where the goal is to create uh, artificial organisms in a laboratory setting. And some of this involves re-engineering existing organisms, but there's a major uh, thrust to try to create artificial cells, starting with basically simple chemical systems and cobbling them together into a, a chemical super system that begins to assume the properties of life. These are referred to as protocells. But when you examine the work that's being done, let's say in, try, in trying to create a protocell or re-engineer an organism into a new organism, what becomes evident very quickly is that you have the best minds in the world employing elaborate strategies and then uh, de developing from these strategies elaborate laboratory protocols that require experts to execute, execute with high precision uh, manipulations in a laboratory setting. And so, in other words, everything that we've seen when it comes to re-engineering life or trying to create protocells indicates empirically intelligent agency is needed. So if we couple this empirical demonstration of what it takes 
to make a protocell or to re-engineer an existing life form with, again, the, the, the arguments that we can make from analogy between human designs and biochemical designs and then point out difficulties uh, explaining the origin of life, we've got a very compelling weight of evidence argument, I think, that the only way to explain the origin and the history of life is that intelligent agencies ultimately orchestrating uh, the, the entire uh, framework of biology. Uh, Prem, would you like to get in on this? I think it's been very well said. I wouldn't uh, try to improve upon it. <laughs> okay, excellent, excellent. And uh, uh, Dr. Leitner, uh, we, we've been talking about the uh, information content of life. Uh, could you just for the audience in general uh, give us an idea of how many bits of information would be in say uh, one strain of DNA in one cell? Um, I have no idea, but I know it's a lot. You have information on top of information on top of information. You have the information that's just in the sequence of the DNA, and then there's information that tells you when and where and how that information gets expressed. So it is incredibly complex. And in fact, in my opinion, the information argument is difficult to use because there's so many levels of information, we don't even know all of what is there. And so generally speaking, I talk about complexity and complex biochemical systems and while I agree with the information argument, I don't normally use it. Okay, uh, Dr. Rana, I, th I know you've uh, done some articles on the in project, the ENCODE project. Would you like to tell us what we're discovering there? Yeah, well, you know, uh, and, and first of all, I'd say I would agree with Gene. I, I love the information argument, but it's a very tricky argument to use because there's just layers and layers and layers of interconnected information in, in, in even in the simplest bacteria. And so, again, I think Dr. Leitner points out a, a very important point. It's just so, it's very difficult to uh, quantify it, but it's very clear that so, that kind of an integrated information system has to require a mind to put it into play. Now, when it comes to the ENCODE project, this relates to, again, this idea of information because uh, for, for several decades, uh, evolutionary biologists have argued that genomes of organisms, the entire genetic makeup of an organism, is largely comprised of non-functional junk DNA that was essentially a vestige of an evolutionary history. And in 2011, phase two of the ENCODE project was published, and this was a radical reimagining of what genomes look like, because based on those ENCODE results, it looks as at minimum 80% of the human genome consists of functional DNA. And the, the feeling is, by most people that are involved in that work, that the, 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 the amount of functional DNA in the human genome probably is going to push close to about 100%. And so this is, again, incredible. And a lot of that information is not encoding for protein products, but rather it's all involved in regulating the expression of those protein products at the just right time throughout the course of the cell cycle and throughout the course of the developmental process in order to produce the human, the human organism. And so, again, it's, it's astounding at the complexity and the, the, the multi-tiered levels of information that you see in the human genome, and it's mind-boggling. It's beyond our capacity even to conceive how complex the genome is and how sophisticated and elegant it, it is and has to be in order to produce the human organism. I think what we see here is, is genomes going from being something that uh, evolutionary biologists would, would be very fond to point to as evidence for an evolutionary history to life to now something that I think it creates a real problem for an evolutionary perspective, but it provides us with a fertile, with fertile ground to expand the design argument in ways that I can't even imagine here today, but imagine in a decade uh, we're going to be, again, looking at, at, at in amazement at what we see and learn from genomics. Uh, now, I'm, I'm going to put this out there for anyone because I'm not sure of the answer to this one. That's usually a bad, a bad choice for a host to make. But do we know how you go from DNA? We, we, obviously, we understand a lot about uh, 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 protein uh, development, et cetera, coming from the DNA. But do we understand how it is that you go from a, 
zygote to individual types of cells for liver, heart, and then there, and also where the information stored that also gives the entire body plan. Do we, do we have that figured out yet? That's out there for anyone? Dr. Leitner? Limited degree. We understand pieces of it. Hmm. We understand that there are certain things that can tell DNA, no, you don't get copied. Um, they're epigenetic tags. Or um, they can make it so, yes, you will uh, go, we'll copy this section and produce these proteins. So there's various tags that get put on, and as tissues um, become distinct, they have different epigenetic tags. And as, um, as Dr. Rana was alluding to, there is an incredible amount of control. You have to have the right proteins in the right place at the right time in the right amount. And it's incredibly complex, and we have pieces of the puzzle that we understand, but it's just so amazing. There's so much there. We have plenty to learn. Have, have we ever made a protein? Anybody? Does anybody know of a protein that was produced outside of a cell? <clears throat> yes. In fact, um, there's been um, uh, studies done in synthetic biology where people have started from scratch and have actually made uh, artificial proteins that are, are unlike anything that we see in biological systems. Uh, they still are made up of the same amino acids and so on and so forth. So these, these proteins have been designed conceptually, uh, again, to carry out uh, functions that you wouldn't see in biological systems. Uh, but in order to make them, you've got to employ the cell's machinery to make those proteins. So uh, where, where does the first proteins come from? Yeah, well, I mean, okay. really the question uh, that an origin of life researcher would ask is, where does the first RNA come from? Because most researchers think that proteins would be a rather late invention uh, when it comes to the origin of life process. They, they don't think DNA and proteins would have appeared initially with the very first cells. This is called, because of what's something known as the chicken and egg paradox, they think the very first uh, life would have been basically RNA-based, and so they're trying to explain where does the first RNA come from. And this is a, a, a very serious, challenging problem for um, original life researchers. In fact, I heard the late Leslie Orgel at an original life conference, basically, uh, after he delineated all the problems with uh, the RNA world hypothesis and trying to explain where the very first RNA would come from, threw up his hands and basically said it would be a miracle if a strand of RNA ever appeared on the primitive Earth. So uh, it's, it, the, the problem is, again, intractable in my mind to explain the origin of life. Are, are you saying that RNA would not, uh, was not hardy enough to exist outside of a cell membrane? Without well, I mean, you, the problem is even more profound than that. Uh, you, you can't even generate uh, the building blocks that you need to assemble the RNA. And once you have those building blocks, it's questionable if you can get those building blocks to assemble into an RNA molecule. And as you point out, RNA is a highly labile molecule. It's not very stable. It doesn't hang around very long for a number of reasons. Uh, and so, yeah, you, you have... It's not just stability of the RNA molecule. The, the problems are going back to even generating the building blocks themselves. Mm. There's a, there are literally intractable problems at each step of the conceived origin of life pathway to RNA. Well, what, what, I'll, I'll turn this to Prim. Prim, what, what do you think, how do you feel that the information content in RNA or DNA, depending on, on how you see things, how do you think that points to the origin of life? Uh, what do you think that tells you about the origin of life? Do, in, in your opinion, do you think that uh, uh, a warm pond somewhere with the prebiotic soup uh, results in this information? Well, I think that there has been research done uh, in statistics and in, uh, from a computer science perspective. Uh, if, you, if I can uh, sort of summarize it, it would be as follows. Um, if you were to take every piece, every single piece of matter in the universe, every single atom in the universe, and use that atom to build one giant computer, in other words, we're going to take the whole universe and make a computer out of it, 
and then have that computer go through all the different possibilities and combinations of, of how atoms should be organized, you would still need way more millions, million by factors of millions and billions more years, even purely randomly for a computer to generate enough combinations to, to come up with something that would look like our universe with all the living things in it. Hmm. So in other words, there just isn't enough time, um, even from the standpoint of an old universe, for there to have been enough uh, combinations of, of uh, atoms tried out, as it were, uh, to produce what we have today. Hmm. So if randomness is at the heart of producing the information, uh, this, the, our current state of affairs should not have been obtained even after 13 or 14 billion years. So we can, uh, at one level, point to just, the, just this fact to show that randomness is not going to deliver uh, the product. So that's one way of looking at it. Yeah. Uh, but the other issue is that whenever you have some contingent features, so features that could have been otherwise, uh, you're looking at a form. So we have matter, which is the stuff out of which things are made. Then we have form, which refers to the, the, the exact shape and the structure and the intangible form in which that matter gets organized. And uh, forms can only exist in minds. Mm -hmm. So it seems that we don't have really a mechanism to, to, uh, to produce all the contingent features that, that the universe has, that the universe really didn't need to have. Okay, well, you know, I, uh, I know that Dr. Rana is going to be leaving us in just a few minutes, and, I, and I've known Dr. Rana for several years now. Uh, I think everybody's story is interesting as far as uh, how, how, uh, how they come to be where they are, how they come to be in science, how they become their faith, etc. Dr. Rana, before you leave us, would you just mind us giving us a few minutes of your background? Sure thing. Well, um, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. In fact, uh, my father was a Muslim. He was from India and came to the United States via Canada uh, in the, the 1950s. My mom was from a non-Catholic, or sorry, was a non-practicing non Catholic, came from a Catholic background. And so when my parents married, they kind of agreed to disagree when it came to religion but my father was uh, a, the more religious of my two parents. And uh, again, he was uh, deeply committed to Islam. My mother never converted to Islam when they married. But when my brother and I were growing up, we were exposed to Islam. And, and by the time that I was um, uh, leaving high school and entering into college, I was an agnostic. I didn't know if God existed or not, and I really didn't care. I dabbled in Islam a little bit as a young man and, and kind of gave it up for a number of reasons and uh, I accepted the evolutionary paradigm when I was uh, um, an undergraduate student. But when I went to graduate school and began to learn about biochemical systems in detail, uh, I was quickly impressed with the complexity of these systems, but also their elegance and their sophistication. And as I examined explanations for the origin of life, I quickly concluded that there had to be a mind behind everything. And that opened me up to hearing the gospel message. And six months later, I converted to Christianity. And so for me, you know, the science and uh, the Christian faith are, are go hand in hand. Science paved the way to my conversion to Christianity. And, uh, you know, as we've talked here, I've, uh, from the moment of my conversion, as I immersed myself in the scriptures, I always saw harmony between what scripture taught and what I was learning to be true as a scientist. And, uh, you know, I think that's one of the things that makes the Bible unique is that, again, it, it is this remarkable book that no matter how you test it, whether scientifically or historically, it, it, it proves itself to be true. Well, thank, thank you so much for being with us tonight, uh, Dr. Rana. Uh, Thanks for having me. You're, you're very welcome, sir. Well, we're here on the ABN Sats Trinity Channel during the uh, International Apologetics Marathon. Please consider praying for this channel, praying for this network, for the outreach we do 
Uh, we can't do it without your prayer, and, and if you can, your financial support, please go to the website and consider giving. Thank you so much. We'll be back in just a moment. Do you have a Samsung Smart TV? Would you like to watch the Trinity Channel on your Samsung Smart TV device? We'd like to share with you an easy way to set up the Trinity Channel and view it on any Samsung Smart TV. If you set the home page on your browser to this address shown on the screen, the Trinity Channel will broadcast live upon entering the browser. It takes about five seconds to load the website once entering the browser. If you have any questions about setting up the Trinity Channel on your Samsung Smart TV device, please give ABN a call at 248-416-1300 and we'll be happy to help you. Hi, good evening. Welcome back to the fifth day of the second annual Christian Apolog International Apologetics Marathon here on the Trinity Channel. Tonight we're doing the fi Science and Faith Show and uh, we're doing the topic of the scientific accuracy of the Bible. Dr. Rana has left now after the break. and We have a new guest. We're very, very pleased to have Dr. Michael Strauss. Welcome to the show, Dr. Strauss. It's great to be here. All right, let me tell you, let me tell our guest a little bit about you. Dr. Mike Strauss received his PhD in high energy physics from UCLA. He's a David Ross Boyd professor of physics at the University of Oklahoma a member of the D0 collaboration that is the group that studied the interaction of protons and antiprotons at Fermi National Accelerate, National Accelerate Laboratory just outside Chicago. He's a member of ATLAS collaboration at the European Laboratory for Particle Physics which if you don't speak English is in uh, CERN and uh, that's in Geneva, Switzerland. He also is affiliated with uh, Dr. Rana's same organization, Reasons to Believe. We're so happy to have you here tonight uh, Dr. Strauss. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, can we play the clip? We, we have an interesting clip uh, because of the recent news uh, in the last year or so about the discovery of the Higgs boson, which is a subatomic particle of some importance. Do we have that clip ready to roll? Okay, let's go ahead and play it then. The Higgs is part of the, what has been termed as the Higgs boson. Right. So explain the Higgs and the boson both. Okay, we're can. celebrating the fact that we have found a new particle never seen before in Mother Nature by slamming two beams of proton at trillions of, of electron volts. And this particle, we think, was in fact a particle like this, was the fuse that set off the explosion which created the universe. So that everything we see around us, the galaxies, the planets, the Earth, life itself, is a byproduct of an explosion which was set off by a Higgs-like particle. We think that originally the universe was a gas of particles with no mass at all. Think of a crystal, beautiful crystal, totally symmetrical, but useless. It exploded. And the shattering of this crystal gave us all the masses of the particles today. The electron, the proton, the neutron, the atom. Why do we have a nucleus? Why do we have a proton? Because they have masses. So the explosion of the particle broke the original perfect symmetry of this crystal, giving us the broken world we see today of planets, stars, galaxies, you, me, even love. All of it from this explosion triggered by a Higgs-like particle. Okay, it's still very complex, but... I know that you often break out into uh, the sociological implications of science as well. This is the beginning of a very, very big conversation, isn't it? This isn't just science. This is how science may actually disprove religion because you said you cringe when you hear God particle. Is, is that where we may be headed with this? Even more than that, realize that the Higgs boson takes us to the instant of creation itself and we can run the videotape before the Big Bang. We can talk about the universe before the creation of the universe itself. If our universe is a soap bubble of some sort and it's expanding, there could be other soap bubbles out there, other universes. And so this is where the next step beyond the Large Hadron Collider comes in. We're going to look for evidences of a pre-Big Bang universe, perhaps the existence of other universes. And then, of course, we have the question that everyone asks me, is Elvis Presley still alive in another <laughs> parallel universe? Is he? Maybe. <laughs> you can't rule it out. Come on. We're going there? Really? We're going into areas that, that take us before the instant of Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. We're talking about going before the beginning itself. 
I tell you, this is deep. This is really deep. It has philosophical, theological implications as we talk about a universe, a parallel universe, other universes out there coexisting with ours. And the Large Hadron Collider, this gigantic machine in Geneva, is the key to perhaps proving the existence of these other dimensions. Let's bring in our expert, uh, Dr. Strauss. You're a particle physicist. Uh, and You worked at CERN. Uh, first, let's get to the basics. What is a Higgs boson and why is it important? Yeah, so since about 19, mid, early 1960s, particle physicists have had this overriding model of what the universe looks like. We call it the standard model of particle and fields. And over the last 50 years or so, that model has been confirmed through a number of experiments. And that model's made predictions about what particles we should see in nature. Um, up until 2012, there was one missing piece of that standard model of particles and fields, and that was this particle called the Higgs boson, named after Peter Higgs, who was one of the six uh, theoretical physicists who proposed it. And so it was a necessary piece of this puzzle. If you've ever put a jigsaw puzzle together and you have one missing piece, you go out of your way to find it. And this is what we had done. We went out of our way building this large Hadron Collider with the primary purpose of finding this last piece of the standard model of particles and fields. And as was said in the video, the main um, function of this particle is it, its interaction with other particles give those other particles their mass. So in the theory um, that you can write out, uh, fundamental particles like quarks inside the protons don't have a mass. And by their interaction with this Higgs boson or this Higgs field, they acquire a mass. So it really is a very foundation and fundamental particle in our understanding of the universe. So, so where is the Higgs field? Well, the Higgs field permeates all of space. Um, and so there would be Higgs bosons everywhere. The problem is to really say that you've discovered this is you have to create one and see it decay in such a way that you know it comes from a Higgs particle. So although there are Higgs particles all over um, space everywhere, that's not enough to actually have proved that this Higgs field exists. So let me say one more thing. What's the connection between a Higgs field and a Higgs particle? Well, in particle physics, every field is made up of individual components, you can think of them. A, a very rough analogy would be like a pool of water is made up of individual water molecules. And so the, the Higgs field is comprised of these Higgs bosons. Okay, well, we, we heard it in the article, and the reason it got so much press is because it was called the God particle, and as you heard the host say, she said that this has theological implications. What, is it because they called it the Higgs, uh, uh, the Higgs particle, the God particle, or why do they call it the God particle? Yeah, so I don't know a single physicist who actually likes that name, the God particle. Um, it was called that because a, a Nobel Prize winner named Leon Letterman wrote a book on the search for the Higgs boson, um, and his publisher wanted to sell books. Not a bad thing if you're a publisher. And so his publisher came up with this title, The God Particle, to describe the Higgs boson because um, it was a great uh, marketing tool to sell books. And so really, that's the only reason. This particle um, is greatly significant in our understanding of the nature of the universe. But you could argue it's not necessarily any more significant than other particles, and its name came simply as a marketing tool. So uh, let's, let's bring some of the other guests here in. If anybody's familiar, I, I assume, uh, Prem, you have some familiarity with this subject. Uh, do you think this in any way disproves religion? No, I don't think so. I think it's still part of what we call the, the, the closed causal nexus of forces and and uh, particles so the Higgs boson is one more player in in as as uh, Dr. Strauss mentioned the, the the jigsaw puzzle that we are uh, assembling to uh, uh, by doing this research so I, I don't see any um, any anything coming out of uh, the discovery of the Higgs particle to to imply somehow that uh, belief in uh, a creator out that who's distinct from the universe is somehow threatened by by this research. Doc, Dr. Leitner, did you lose your faith after they discovered the Higgs particle? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> One comment I might make. Yeah. Um, science is 
pretty good when we can observe and we can experiment and we can test and we can repeat. And part of the discussion, you heard that, we're talking about what's going on in our physical world right here and now and we're observing things and that's great. But in the video clip, he talks about what happened in the past. And we need to be a little careful when we have models of the past. That's true whether you're talking biology, geology, or physics, because we have very limited observations. We can't go back and watch it happen. We have very limited experiments we can do, and we, we can't go back and repeat history. So when we model things, and I modeled something for my uh, master's degree, I, and it didn't have to do with history, I found a correlation and I measured something very accurately. But then in order to use the model, I had to make assumptions. Well, when I got the results back, I looked at it and said, this doesn't make sense. So my assumptions that the, the specific conditions when the uh, great correlation was described would also apply in these other circumstances turned out to be wrong. And I know that with the Big Bang, you not only have observations that discuss that the universe appears to be expanding, you not only have the cool math with general relativity, but in order to apply the math, you have to make assumptions. And for the Big Bang, you assume that the universe has no edge and it has no center and the Earth isn't anywhere special. Mm. And you get a, a model, and it's great. It's a scientific model. That, that we scientists, we do that. Um, but you can take exactly the same observations and the same math and you can say, okay, let's have the universe have an edge and let's have the Earth be somewhere around the middle. It doesn't have to be exact, but somewhere close. You get a different model. And there was a, a physicist named uh, Russ Humphreys that did that. And all you had to do to change the model was change the assumptions. Well, which assumptions are right? Well, you don't know which assumptions are right. So we're really reaching beyond the realm of what science is good at. We're reaching back into the past where all sorts of things could have happened and we can't directly observe it. So it's not that science can't help at all, but it's limited. And that's where science really has a problem because there's just too many possibilities. And how do you decide between them? Hmm. Dr. Uh, Dr. Strauss, would you like to uh, contribute to this discussion? Uh, yeah, certainly I think the remarkable thing is that observational science has come to the same conclusion that the Bible said, and you talked about that during the first hour, is that the Bible starts out with this statement that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, the universe, and that observational science has shown that this universe did have a beginning. And so it's really quite remarkable. If we had been having this conversation 100 years ago, most scientists would have thought the universe is eternal. Um, and now most scientists believe um, that the universe had nearly a beginning. There are certainly questions as to what happened in the first 10 to the minus 32 seconds. But apart from that, we would all agree that the observations are completely consistent with the universe having an actual beginning. Prem, would you like to uh, contribute a little bit on this one? Have you got uh, some feelings or some opinions on this, uh, how science works and when it, when it doesn't work as well? Yeah, I think one of my interests has been to look into the assumptions that, that uh, we have to hold in order to do science. Even, even the fact that mathematics is able to track physical reality so well has been uh, a, a source of, of uh, wonder for uh, several scientists, notably Albert Einstein, the Hungarian physicist Eugene P. Wigner, and uh, Max, uh, Max Planck as well, who, uh, who is known to have said, uh, if you're going to come to the, the, the gates of the temple of science, you're going to see the words, you must have faith, written uh, over it. So there, the, why exactly does mathematics, how do we know, how do we account for the fact that mathematics tracks physical reality as well as it does when mathematics was developed independent of uh, considerations of uh, physical human experience. Uh, so it's not just the assumptions, but even the fact that mathematics can be used uh, is uh, an object, is a source of, uh, source of wonder. So I think that when we do science, it's, uh, it's uh, useful sometimes to step back a little bit and ask what are the presuppositions that 
uh, science scientists and the scientific community uh, must hold in order to to embark on on scientific investigation. So um, just the the very idea that math describes the physical world uh, itself is is one of those uh, presuppositions. We also have to rely on the principle of induction uh, and that nature is somehow uniform, that uh, the laws of physics are not capricious and they're not going to suddenly change on us tomorrow. Uh, while this is a very reasonable uh, assumption, it's, it is still a, an assumption nevertheless. So there are several assumptions like these and once in a while I think it's useful for, for us who are uh, keenly interested in science to step back and, and uh, just say, hey, what is a kind of uh, endeavor that we are embarking on when we do science? And the reason I bring that up is because today in society, science has been promoted to the status of uh, religion. Uh, so we refer to this, this inordinate exaltation of science as scientism, which is a, a sort of a dogmatic uh, view that science always tells us truth that cannot be questioned. And mm -hmm. uh, I think we should temper our understanding of, of science by looking at it, its uh, various assumptions. So you're saying in the mathematic field, you're saying that as opposed to mathematics being a tool that was invented by humans to help them to uh, survive, you're saying that mathematics is something that was discovered by humans that pre-existed, that is that there's a mind, a rationality behind the creation. Well, I guess what I'm saying is is more along the lines of the of of this, which is that mathematicians, when they developed mathematics, were not necessarily trying to describe the physical world. Mathematics is its own discipline, and it it's a a, a form of of knowledge which is which doesn't depend upon uh, physical experience. It has nothing to do with the laws of physics. So then, when we do find uses for mathematics. Uh, wherein uh, rather abstract and uh, difficult to imagine concepts like imaginary numbers and um, so on, uh, infinite sets and infinite sequences and things like this are actually found to be useful in describing how the physical world works. Well, how is that even the case? Uh, Eugene Wigner, the Hungarian physicist, wrote uh, an article in the 19, sometime in the 1960s, and the article was titled The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics. So I'm not arguing necessarily for a creator uh, or, or a mind uh, because of mathematics itself, although that is a, a, an argument in its own right worth uh, looking into. What I'm saying is that uh, we have to realize that not all of mathematics de uh, describes reality, but some of it does. And, I, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead, please. Yeah, and mathematics is a presupposition. The truths of mathematics are a presupposition of physical science. We don't know, we don't prove mathematics to be true by doing physics experiments or chemistry or um, by observing biological or organisms. It's the other way around. If mathematics uh, did not track correctly with the physical world, we would not be able to do physics as if effectively as we are able to do it. All right, thank you, Prem. That's very excellent. Uh, besides the CNN interview with Dr. Haku in which he uh, made certain claims which proved to be uh, not well grounded, besides that, uh, Lawrence Krauss, the physicist from Arizona State, came out with a book last year called A Universe from Nothing, which is uh, not the best received book ever, but it's very extremely popular within the uh, atheistic community. Uh, Dr. Strauss, in the, view, in the book, A Universe from, A Universe from Nothing, uh, Lawrence Krauss says that he, only physicists actually understand nothing, that philosophers and theologians don't know what they're talking about. Uh, could you touch on that just a little bit? What is nothing? Yeah, I think that's an interesting quote because I think most physicists would disagree with Lawrence Krauss's definition of nothing. Uh, what we know is that what we commonly call a vacuum is, is hardly nothing. It's teeming with what are called virtual particles. This is the structure of space and time of the universe we live in. And so 
when Larry, Larry Krause says that the universe comes from nothing, his nothing is basically very similar to the vacuum of space in this universe, the vacuum of space-time. And so uh, the reason he would say that philosophers and theologians don't understand nothing is because it disagrees with his definition of nothing. But his definition of nothing does not look like truly what you or I would think of nothing. It looks like uh, the space-time structure of this universe. And once you have the space-time structure of this universe, He's saying you can you can spawn other universes. He's one of the few people I know who would agree with his definition of nothing. Uh, I saw a very negative review of that book on the New York Times, so I, uh, it, but it still remains extremely popular. Uh, does his nothing have fields and dimensions? Well, it has the capability of bringing up fields and dimensions, and so it, it's very much like a, a something with fields and dimensions. It's very much like our, our quantum vacuum. So this is an important thing to actually discuss. Um, when, when you read articles, there was an article just a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, um, that made the New York Times and Wall Street Journal and major publications that scientists have once again, quote, disproved the Big Bang. And what they mean by that is that we have a good understanding of the universe from about somewhere around 10 to the minus 32 seconds after the Big Bang until now. The laws that we know of physics and chemistry um, consistently and perfectly uh, predict the universe we see once you start from about 10 to the minus 32 seconds after the Big Bang. But nobody knows what happens in before that. And if this theory called cosmic inflation is true, we'll never know what happened before that. So those who don't believe in a God, it, it really is the, the atheism of the gaps, lo are looking at that first 10 to the minus 36 seconds and saying, since we don't know what happened there, what can we insert there to preclude any creator? Because everything we see since then looks like there's a true beginning and a true creator. And so that's exactly what this book um, and other books that are written by new atheists recently are doing. They're looking at an unknown area of physics. We do not know what happened in the first 10 to minus 36 seconds. And they're imposing a um, naturalistic, atheistic view on that and saying what happened. I'm actually not even atheistic, naturalistic, because God works through nature. So, you know, Christians do not adhere to the God of the gaps arguments. Even um, what we say is God can work through nature. When I see a beautifully designed mechanism in nature, I say that that was done by God. And so it's really not a disproval of the Big Bang in any of these new atheist arguments. It's more a speculation about what happened at that true moment of creation. Thank you. Uh, if you've just if you just joined us, you're getting in kind of late. We're uh, we're in the closing point here. We've had a wonderful discussion tonight on the science and faith and the scientific accuracy of the Bible. I want to give a special, uh, my very heartfelt thanks to our guest tonight, uh, Dr. Gene Leitner. Thank you so much for being here tonight and for your your knowledge and for your uh, heart for the gospel. We thank you for that. And uh, Dr. Fazali Rana, Fuzz Rana, who just uh, who left a little while ago, Vice President uh, at uh, Reasons to Believe, we thank him very much for being here. Prim Isaac, we uh, we love you, brother, and we thank you so much for your valuable contribution. And Dr. Mike Strauss, uh, thank you so much for being here. And uh, I'd like to put out a special request that if I get a chance to do this again, can I just have you on here for an hour and a half? <laughs> I'd be happy to join you again sometime. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this has been a wonderful program. We've gotten into some pretty deep areas, but what we've shown, I, I believe that we've demonstrated in, in this short amount of time as well as we could, that the Bible does not conflict with science, that the Bible conflicts with some scientist, but that their, that their motivation, as uh, Dr. Strauss pointed out, is, is not a motivation of truth it's a, a necessarily it's a motivate it's a motivation of truth within certain narrow confines and we ask the viewers if you've enjoyed this program if you've enjoyed this network and you and you see the work that's being done here especially during this second international apologetics marathon please consider giving please consider going to the website or calling the number and please consider supporting this so that we can stay on the air so that we can continue to carry the gospel to parts of the world that will never hear it from a person because there's some parts, as we all know, that are closed off to hearing the gospel proclaimed openly. Thank you so much. May God bless you all. Good evening.